Pleomorphic adenoma is the most common salivary gland tumor. It is benign, and its defining feature is um, this cytological and architectural heterogeneity. That's what the word pleomorphic in its name stands for, contrary to what we usually understand uh, with this descriptor, which is neoplastic cytological atypia, which is not a feature of pleomorphic adenoma. Instead, um, pleomorphic um, refers here to its characteristic cytoarchitectural polymorphism, um, if you wish. Pleomorphic adenoma is best um, looked at or regarded as a triphasic tumor consisting of a dual cell population of ductal or so-called epithelial and myoepithelial cells and a stromal component. And the stromal component is characteristically of a chondromyxoid nature, but it may also be fibrous, fibromyxoid, hyalinized, or even metaplastic with bone formation and adipose tissue. And we will see a better example of these uh, in a bit. Pleomorphic adenoma has a slight female predominance. In the majority of cases, in up to 80% of cases, it affects the parotid gland, but it may also affect minor salivary glands, and when it occurs in the oral cavity, it usually affects the palate. But it may also be seen in some unusual sites, which is um, a, fact, a fact that is um, good to be aware of, such as in the larynx, in the external auditory canal, or in the sinonasal tract. Pleomorphic adenoma is a well-circumscribed tumor. It may or may not be encapsulated and has a typical um, characteristic bosselated outer contour. And this is reflected on imaging, with it being a hypoechoic, well-defined and lobulated lesion on ultrasound, which usually mimics a cyst until you use Doppler and show its high internal vascularization. It is hyperintense on T2-weighted imaging on MRI and shows avid contrast enhancement. It has an excellent prognosis with uh, complete surgical resection being essentially curative. Recurrences are rare but possible, and this happens mostly in situations with incomplete surgical resection, and malignant transformation is also possible. And here we talk about the so-called carcinoma expiomorphic adenoma. That means carcinoma arising from pleomorphic adenoma. That's what the term X stands for, arising from. Uh, with pleomorphic adenomas, we talk about so-called benign metastases. Uh, and these are thought to occur due to surgical manipulation of the tumor with detachments of that detachment of parts of the tumor um, into blood vessels with subsequent uh, embolization to different organs. Now, this is how a typical pleomorphic adenoma would look like under the microscope. And I want you to keep this low power image in mind. Notice how it is well circumscribed and has a prominent myxoid stroma. Pleomorphic adenomas, as we said, are triphasic tumors. They consist of a dual cellular component and the stromal component. One of these components may predominate, and in this image, it is this myxoid or chondomyxoid stroma that predominates over the cellular component. Here's an example that shows a more chondroid or chondromyxoid stroma. Notice also the bosselated outer contour of this otherwise well-circumscribed lesion. And sometimes you may see finger-like or tongue-like projections from the main tumor mass into the adjacent normal non-neoplastic salivary gland parenchyma. And these are called pseudopodia, like false feet, false legs. Um, and this, together with, sometimes you see at the periphery of the tumor, admixed um, normal non-neoplastic asini. And both of these features, the pseudopodia and the admixed asini at this, the periphery of this otherwise well-circumscribed tumor, do not signify an invasive growth pattern. Here's a higher power view of the typical chondroid stroma of these benign neoplasms. Notice how the spindled myoepithelial cells seemingly merge with the stroma. They get lost within the stroma. This is another typical thing that you see in pleomorphic adenomas. And now let's move on to the dual epithelial myoepithelial component of this tumor. This particular specimen has a lot more epithelial than stromal component, but there is still this characteristic fibromyxoid to chondromyxoid stroma in the background. So we see these irregular nests, anastomosing cords, trabeculae, and tubular structures consisting of a dual cell population with an outer layer of myopithelial cells, which can assume a range of cytomorphologies. I'm going to show you some examples in a bit. But essentially, they can look epithelioid, they can look basaloid, spindled, plasmacytoid. They can have a clear cell morphology and whatnot. Um, and apart from this, an inner layer of ductal cells. The stroma is a bit more fibrous in this example, but there are definitely areas where it is more classically myxoid. There are also some scattered mature adipocytes as part of a stromal metaplastic process, but I'm going to show you better images in a bit. Sometimes um, the tubular structures fuse and form 
these cribriform formations, which might remind you of adenoid cystic carcinoma. And this is one of the, uh, one of the main differential diagnoses of pleomorphic adenoma. Sometimes you see um, these compressed tubular structures that like form like cords um, and microtrabeculi or trabeculi. And notice also the myopathial cells that trickle into the surrounding fibromyxoid stroma. So like I mentioned, myoepithelial cells can assume a range of morphologies. They can look epithelioid, they can look basaloid when they have a little bit less cytoplasm. They can look spindle when the nuclei are elongated and they sit um, parallel to the basement membrane of um, tubular structures together with the ductal cells that usually have nuclei that are polarized around um, the central lumen and are perpendicular to the basement membrane. Um, these are more the more classic morphologies that we also know from breast. They can also have a clear cell morphology, but they can also assume some peculiar cytomorphologies. For example, in this image, we see the myoepithelial cells in the center of the image that have a prominent plasma cytoid. Some would say also a bit rhabdoid, but mostly plasma cytoid morphology, with the nuclei being pushed to the periphery of the cell and the cytoplasm being um, eosinophilic. And this is essentially a feature that we might see in many salivary gland tumors that contain uh, myoepithelial cells. You can see examples of myoepithelial carcinomas that are composed mostly of myoepithelial cells with plasma cytoid features. And you might think of a, I don't know, rhabdoid neoplasm. Because in a sense, these features are very similar morphologically. And again, I want to po point you out again, the background chondral myxoid stroma, which is so characteristic of pleomorphic adenoma, and how the myoepithelial cells get detached and kind of merge with this, this uh, type of stroma. Now, this looks different from what we, we have seen so far. And I wanted to show you this because like I said, the stroma may also be prominently fibrous, as in this example. And another feature that this example um, has is um, adipose metaplasia of the stroma, as well as squamous metaplasia in the cellular component. The pitfall with this is that pleomorphic adenomas may also show mucinous metaplasia with presence of mucocytes next to areas of squamous metaplasia and mimic mucoepidermoid carcinoma. Helpful in this scenario is to remember that prominent keratinization is not a feature of mucoepidermoid carcinoma, as is usually seen in pleomorphic adenomas, as in this example. Also, proving myoepithelial differentiations with a differentiation with immunostains such as S100, SOX10, GFAP, SMA, Calponin, P40, P63 is also helpful in this differential diagnosis. And in particular situations, molecular analysis will show an absence of mammal two rearrangements, which are highly specific for mucoepidermoid carcinoma. Um, pleomorphic adenomas, on the other hand, harbor pathogenic translocations, most frequently involving PLAG1 on uh, chromosome 8q12. And the minority of cases show HMGA2 rearrangements. And there are newly available surrogate antib antibodies for both of these gene products. So if you have them, you may use them in um, um, particular cases to support this diagnosis. With the help of immunostains, of course, you can prove the dual cell population seen in the tumors with the uh, myopathial cells staining for myopathial cell markers and the ductal cells staining for um, cytokeratin 7, CAM 5.2, or pancytokeratin. Other important differential diagnoses, like we said, adenocystic carcinoma, mucoepidermic carcinoma, but also squamous cell carcinoma, uh, myo uh, epithelial myopathial carcinoma, and actually myoepithelial carcinoma is usually confused with pleomorphic adenoma and undercalled because of its uh, bland um, cytology. So it's kind of the way around. Important to remember in the distinction with uh, squamous cell carcinoma, for example, is that while infertype necrosis after um, biopsy and bizarre degenerative atypia may occur in pleomorphic adenomas, um, there are certain features which are not seen, like tumor type necrosis, pleomorphism, increased mitotic rate, or an infiltrative growth, all of which um, are usually seen in aggressive or like high-grade carcinomas, such as uh, squamous cell carcinoma. This is an example of a recurrent pleomorphic adenoma. Um, in the context of recurrences, we usually see a multi-nodular growth pattern. And in this example, we can see at least four nodules of different sizes. Also, um, we see here there is a predominance of the cellular component. So this is a so-called cellular or highly 
um, cellular pleomorphic adenoma. And you can see how sometimes the differential diagnosis or reaching the right diagnosis in this case may be problematic when, um, it, when there is such a high cellularity. So it is also helpful to um, do proper sampling and look for areas with that characteristic chondromyxoid stroma, which is um, always a good supportive feature in this tumor. So to summarize, pleomorphic adenoma has a heterogeneous histomorphology. It is a triphasic tumor composed of ductal and myoepithelial cells, as well as a stromal component, which is characteristically chondromyxoid. It may show squamous metaplasia and mucinous metaplasia, with, which may mimic together mucoepidermoid carcinoma. But remember, prominent keratinization is usually seen in pleomorphic adenoma, and it's an, it is not a feature of mucoepidermoid carcinoma. And pleomorphic adenomas are driven mostly by rearrangements of BLAG1, but also in a minority of cases, uh, rearrangements of HMGA2. There is no infiltrative growth, no pleomorphism, and a low mitotic rate. And with that, we're finished with pleomorphic adenomas.